Week five is a split week. We're going to be dealing with distribution and price. As part of that, we're also going to bring in a number of case illustrations. So the idea from here, as we move forward through the rest of the semester, is that as well as providing you with a theory or a concept, where possible, I will give an example of a website, and it's usually a website, or an app, that I think embodies the theory that we're talking about. So the intention here is that, as well as saying, here's my theory, here's my website, this is an invitation for you to go and explore that site and see how the theory applies in your own practice and your own consumption of the site. So let's get into the four P's of marketing's favorite element, distribution. Now a reminder that we are also going to use the SIVA framework to cross-check. So when we talk about the marketing mix and we talk about the elements we control from our side as marketers and that's our control mechanisms, SIVA exists to be a safety net to run through our decision-making process, run through the outcomes and go, from a consumer's perspective, are we providing a useful solution that they are informed about, that they can access, that provides them value? And specifically, in terms of when we talk about distribution, is the distribution part of the solution or does it become part of a problem? And access, can the value offer that we've created be reached by our audience? So if you're looking at something like an online delivery of goods and services, you've got this particular niche market that you service, you create your own homegrown produce, you have it for sale, but you can only ship to within 50 kilometers driving distance of where you're operating, access becomes a challenge for anyone outside that range, anyone outside your, well, say your 5K lockdown distribution cycle. So SIVA exists as a safety net for us, and we'll make use of it as we go through. But in distribution, solution and access are the dominant two. However, the distribution channel also informs the customer about a set of expectations as to what they should be mindful of or thinking about when engaging with the product. And the distribution channel may also be the source where they get taught how to use the product. Now, a couple of other things we want to talk about. Uh, there's a crossover effect that takes place here between the value offer and distribution. Key amongst this is whether we expect the customer to come to us, for example, the live learning classes, or the content goes to the customer. All the pre-recorded materials and the Shadowhawker Wednesday releases. It's a difference between subscription and search. It's a difference between uh, our offers going to be actively pursued by our customer, in which case they will arrive with a heightened sense of interest and awareness. But to get them in the first place, they need to know that we exist. So we need to think about problem, problem recognition. We need to think about the funnel, the AIDA. Or is it home delivered? Is it we've already got through awareness and interest and now we're about the affirmation of desire through to action because they're in a position to consume for example our subscriptions on YouTube provides us with our content do we then watch the video the video pops up in the feed up to Monday it's a star of video do I set myself my 30 minutes allocation of British men jumping about from wall to wall because if at the end of the run, I can put the value offer in front of the consumer. If they don't consume it, we didn't get value. Also, there's the aspect of the notion of exclusivity. Now, we have exclusivity as something in price. And we have exclusivity in digital. So we've got things like exclusive downloadable content, uh, restricted access through Patreon or the YouTube membership, 
there are ways in which paywalls can create exclusivity, which create the functional distribution channel mechanisms, but they improve the overall value of the product, its positioning, and some of its pricing aspects. And also digital packaging. Now this one is a bit of a, an interesting one. In the era of cloud computing, it's quite often we think of, oh, it's just, you know, oh, it's on a server somewhere, so we don't really have to think about our product. But what are the steps required for someone to access your digital product? A download, then a click to open, or a download, click to install, run through the installation process, then click to activate. Do you run into the digital packaging problem of click to website, website says, oh, hi, register, please, or log in, please, and then it doesn't follow, it then drops you back out to the front page rather than to the direct delivery of the value offer that you were trying to communicate through your email. Be conscious of these aspects, be aware of these aspects, because they will increase some of the non-financial prices associated with your product. And the last aspect to the positioning strategy that's really important here, distribution lets us play around with the idea of who else is in the shop with us. Now, if you're thinking about this as a virtual environment, what other products are on Instagram or what other companies are using this hashtag? What other places when you go to Amazon and you ask, you know, so a customer asks to buy your product, what else is recommended to them? YouTube and the algorithm. What is the consequence of listening to or watching your video? What other content is then on recommended? And YouTube's been quite problematic for that because there have been moments where I have been served content for whom I am very much not the target market simply because I've been listening to uh, faux retro 80s vaporwave music and suddenly I've got a whole bunch of ranty white blokes talking about politics and it's because YouTube's algorithm positioned these people off the back of that music so be really paying attention you've got it one of the things about e-marketing is it's not fire and forget the reason why we use a structured paste release of content and tasks in this course is because once you put content up you can't just abandon it without unexpected consequences happening you've got to be monitoring you've got to be tracking is this positioning where I want it to is the algorithm throwing me amongst a company I don't want and what is happening with the force-fed advertisements showing up in my feed that makes it look like I'm endorsing certain products brands or attitudes so awareness and continual engagement now the last thing I want to say before we get into some big theory uh, I want to talk about my favorite controversial model in marketing it's entirely controversial because there is one group of people who count the arrows and one group of people who count the boxes or in this case circles so the direct channel to intermediaries is either a four level or three level, depending on if you're into arrows or you're into circles. What you need to know is that if you are hosting your own content on your own website, I would treat that as manufacturer to customer. If you are using a platform for the express purpose of that platform being your channel, so I've mentioned YouTube there, but on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, they are retailers of content. They are retailers of ideas. If someone then posts your content to another platform, your content, your provider, so you create a YouTube video, someone posts it up in a Reddit forum, they become the retailer. Reddit and that Reddit post becomes the retailer YouTube's the wholesaler, and it's taken multiple steps to get between from you to your audience. But functionally, the important thing down there is that you've gotten to the audience. And one of the things, there's a bit of a mixed blessing here. Sometimes it's about 
it doesn't matter how I get to the audience. It matters that I got there. Other times you'll run into one of the, the major problems about internet distribution. And that is the ease with which you can have the attribution knocked off your content. Now the link here is to a case study from a comic book artist, uh, web comic artist, who had one of their pieces of work go incredibly viral without being attributed to them and also with no backlink or way in which that content would come back or that interest in the content would come back to the source material. In particular, what they found is that a lot of sites, so your 9gag or your 4chan or your Reddit, people were posting the content there and knocking out the attribution so that it went and took the traffic to those core sites. It didn't take the traffic onto. So display did not actually, and distribution did not result in mutual benefit for the original content creator. Now there isn't the mantra there, the if it can be displayed, it can be copied. This is simply, uh, it's an old, it's an old hacker's ethos that I also uh, talk about quite a lot and I've used it in my professional career, that any, the display of content means that that content is being duplicated. So if you have something digital to display, it requires duplication. Watching this video right now, this video is being streamed to you across a one of three possible video platforms. It is being duplicated from the master copy kept on that platform you don't end up in ownership of it, you don't end up in possession of it, and you don't get an exclusivity like you would if it was a physical object. We only had one textbook in the library. You take that out, no copy. A digital textbook in the library can be copied an infinite number of times. Therefore, if it can be displayed, and it's displayed through copying, congratulations, it's gonna get copied. Which brings me on to Honestly, the non-fungible tokens uh, are a thing that I've got to talk about in e-marketing, but equally, I want to say, at this point in time, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and non-fungible tokens, at 2021, as time of recording, mostly are being used either for money laundering, um, speculative gambling, or even weirder applications that are not what the promise of the platform was. So the NFTs, the idea here is that you can, well, the idea that they're pitching is that a digital object could have a recognized owner, therefore that a master copy could exist and somehow you could restrict that master copy from being redistributed. Since the master copy can be displayed, it can be copied. But also one of the things we've seen is that the use of the blockchain as a receipt tool, as a authorization verification tool, means that effectively what you're buying with the NFT is that you are actually buying the receipt of the transaction much more than you're buying the actual object in the transaction. Now, value is definitely going to be created in here for a bunch of different people in a bunch of different ways. I will freely admit that I, as a professional con artist and professional marketer, this appeals to my con artist side more than it appeals to my marketing side. Uh, I think it's brilliant on the aspect of you can liberate a lot of money from people particularly as a speculative economy it's a form of it's a gambling tool and occasionally you get to play uh, you think you're playing as the casino so there's a lot of stuff in here if you're totally into this stuff and yeah it's like your big thing awesome good for you that's a value i'm not the target market for it if you are the target market for it and you're getting value out of it, either co-created or financially created value, two thumbs up. Awesome, but not my thing. 
I've got to mention it a few times because it recurs throughout. Now it's going to show up in distribution pricing and uh, in promotion. It didn't show up in product because I don't fully see it as a pr as a value proposition as much as it is some form of transaction. Um, it's a bit like putting FPOS into product. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about a sequence of product types and then talk about how those product types are distributed through the internet. Oh boy, it's going to get weird at parts because the internet is a big, wild, weird place where stuff happens and it's confusing. So if you get confused in this, it's okay. It is actually supposed to be difficult. Uh, so the first thing, the digital intangible. You are currently experiencing the digital intangible. If you are watching this on Echo360 or Stream or YouTube, you are engaged with the ideas and the experience, so this is the pure intangible. The purpose of this video is to create a state change in you, my students. You've come into this video without the knowledge of, now if this is your first time watching, you've come in without the knowledge of the content, so it should induce a state change by providing new material for you to think about. If this is your second or third pass, hey, thanks for the views. You're then, if it's your second or third pass through, you are intentionally looking for something. You're looking for a state change. Uh, it's either to re-understand a section or to go back to a section that's confused. So you're co-creating value through re-engagement with the ideas. Now, obviously, my, my case study and point that I will always point to here is YouTube. Plays in the browser, plays in the app, intentionally doesn't allow for file downloading that requires third-party plugins or uh, other software. But functionally, there's no transfer of ownership of IP. There's no transfer of ownership of data. So the digital intangible, and in particular, this idea that you will watch and experience, and the idea behind a lot of YouTube videos is to impart a particular experience, be it entertainment, uh, education or indoctrination. The next object, of course, is the putting a little more tangibility on it. And I pause because it's still data. It's just data that you have to put onto a local machine to make it work. YouTube is data in the cloud, and the cloud is someone else's computers. The digital tangible, so watching this video is the intangible. If you've downloaded the PowerPoint slides to go with it, or if you've used Echo 360's download capacity, and you're watching this off your local drive, congratulations on your digital tangible experience. If you've opened up one of the Word documents or PowerPoint documents or PDF files from the Waddle site, that's a digital tangible. Now, one of the things that's really interesting for me here is that you are going to create a number of digital tangibles for me this semester. They will be your assignments. You will then upload them into Turnitin, where they will become digital intangible because I will mark them without downloading them. So there's fungibility. You can move between states of the intangible and the tangible, the digital intangible and the digital tangible here. The other thing that's important to note is that the tangibility of the data opens up a series of market segmentation and target market selection opportunities. Something as basic as the iPhone versus the Android, those are two separate operating systems, so they immediately create a fork in the market because you need two different application types. Those applications, because they are resident on the phone to run are digital tangibles. Other things can be cross-platform. For example, the MP3 is uh, supposed to be a cross-platform audio file, which means that you are then less bound by platform, Windows, Mac, Linux, and more a question of, does the end user have something that they can use to play the file? 
If you don't have access to PowerPoint or OpenOffice, if you don't have access to Acrobat Reader or another PDF reader, a PDF file or a Word doc or a PowerPoint file becomes just data. It's, it has no value because you can't use it. Last thing to mention on here on the digital intangibles is that it's all about the value and use. And it's really important to understand that downloading a file is not the same as reading the file. Printing the file is not the same as reading the file. And it's so annoying that the matrix came out in 1999 and yet we still don't have the capacity to plug in a cable into the side of our skull and learn stuff. I mean, sure, I'm still employed because we don't have that capacity, but it would be totally awesome and I'd be down for it because I'd be able to reskill. Just plug a cable in. My case, uh, by the way, you are going to see Steam and Epic Games appear a couple of times because it's a very interesting marketplace and market space that Steam facilitates digital tangible distribution. You download the video game files to the local drive, you access the video game through the Steam client, which itself you have to download, and then you get the experience once those files are running and you are playing the game. So you don't get a transfer of IP, you don't get ownership of any of the objects within the data set, you get ownership of the right to access it. So it's a value in use, it's a license. Uh, there also then raises questions about um, reuse and secondary use and uh, secondary sales. But we'll worry about those later, if at all. Also, here's a quick snapshot into my library from a couple of months ago, because you'll see that Squadrons is still coming soon. This is where I, what I was playing last year in the second half of the marketing course. And can I just say, big thumbs up for Battletech, well worth playing. And if you haven't seen it before, get your eyes on Mist Survival. It's an independent, small production, possibly even a solo production team. Uh, its sliding graphics capacity is amazing between the ultra high res and the low res. You've got to give it a go sometime. Now let's talk about where it gets progressively more challenging. We've gone from data and we're now going to data that you convert into atoms. And this is your print at home opportunities. So if you've been on Kickstarter and someone's produced a card game, quite often what they'll do is they'll do a print and play version, which is the PDF files they're sending off to the manufacturer or modified versions of those, which you can then download and print at home. You can run off your own uh, home printer or your work printer if the boss isn't watching. The thing is, to do this, you need a printer. So immediately, for value co-creation to take place, there is a requirement for an operand resource. You are looking at an instant market segmentation moment of does the end user, does the audience have access to the object required to create the content? So this opens up, also if we slip back over to SIVA, and start thinking about solution information value access. This is why we talk about solution and access. The solution is a playable game. The access is must have printer, sharp scissors, and the ability to create, to turn the PDF file into a physical playable object. The other place that this is quite big at the moment uh, and as an innovation adoption researcher, 3D printing is sitting in the late innovator, early, early adopter category. It didn't get as widespread as I was expecting. And the entry requirements, the entry barriers are still quite high. So convenient at home 3D printing is less common because it still requires a number of operant resources. It requires a lot of technical skill. It also requires an inordinate amount of patience uh, 
because it goes wrong on a routine basis. I have a couple of friends in Canberra who are prop makers, uh, combustible props. Shout out to Amelia. That they create quite complex and quite intensely difficult 3D prints and they're very good at what they do and I still see things about how almost 14 hours into a 14 hour print job then 13 hours 45 minutes in the, the job failed so first of all your operand resources is your 3d printer and your printer uh, your ink your plastics and your various elements then it's the operant resources of your technical skill plus it took 14 hours for something to go wrong so the patience and the I don't need it quickly the place that does this really well and does actually something quite interesting here is Hero Forge now Hero Forge I backed on Kickstarter years ago and I'd like to uh, welcome our randomly generated character uh, who's now saved into my files and will get produced later but this particular object this 3d object composited from a range of hero forge component parts functionally i can order hero forge to print this and send it to me or i could buy the download file the stl file and print it at home if I had a 3D printer. Convertible and tangible. It currently exists as a data set and can be converted into an object. Which is, brings us into the convertible and tangible for producers. Production side, print on demand. Now, we've been doing print on demand for a long period of time. And most commonly, we were doing print on demand in books and in support of university subjects. So back in the day, what we'd do is we'd create a book of readings. I would assign you know, the 14 weeks worth of readings, bundle up those PDF files, give them to the bookshop and say, when a student orders the readings manual for e-marketing, print this out for them, would you? I tried distributing it on USB one year, but there were copyright issues. But functionally, the object exists as a stored set of data that is then commercially produced on a mass customization scale. Now, I like Redbubble for this particular example because they are also a very friendly, like user friendly, consumer friendly, but also prosumer, conducer, producer friendly platform where you create the IP, you retain your copyright, you upload and license to them the rights for them to tangibilize your data and on sell it where you take a profit and they take a profit. They cover the costs, get a profit margin and you get a markup margin over that. Particularly good example of the convertible intangible because you can create something purely digital and turn it into a reality, turn it into a, an object. They were also really quick into the customizable masks bandwidth, uh, and I think that's brilliant. And whilst I, my custom shirt I wear here is produced in a different house and produced from a different company, Redbubble is one of the places I have looked at and I have used for merchandise, self merchandise conducive behavior in the past. All right, let's move up to the next level, the transportable tangible. We have all done this, just about. If you've bought anything from eBay, if you've shopped at Amazon, or if you've ordered groceries or a pizza online, this is it. The transaction takes place and an object needs to come to you, or you need to go to the object that's waiting for you to pick it up. So it brings a whole bunch of mediation and disintermediation. It means we can go, we can now order directly from retailers, uh, or we can go directly to the manufacturer. We can bypass certain channels. There's all sorts of interesting stuff that happens in here. My favorite for this is definitely Etsy. 
Uh, Etsy recurs as a market space and marketplace because what they do is they are the intermediary that facilitates the sale and the transaction. They run the catalog and handle the checkout and handle the cash register or Bitcoin register or whatever. But functionally, an Etsy space allows you to shift physical objects. You go online, you order it, and then it's the person who has created the object ships the object to you. So there's a double, there's a marketplace channel, which is producer to customer. And there's a market space channel, which is consumer, retailer, manufacturer. Following the transported tangible, is the mediated intangible. And this is the sort of market space overlayer uh, where we start thinking about service delivery online. And functionally what we are looking at here is, again, there's no transfer of intellectual property, there's no transfer of physical object, no data saved to hard drive, but instead the transaction is a mediated service. So we're looking here at things like banking, we're looking at PayPal, whatever it is that goes on with regards to NFTs and share trading and Bitcoin and all the other things. So obviously our case study in point here is going to be our old friend PayPal, the uh, ultimate mediated intangible, the transfer of money through a non-bank platform. There are alternatives to PayPal and there are many. Um, they just didn't get as uh, successful in terms of tying up the banks. And it's the thing, PayPal set out to be a non-financial institution intermediary and its success has come from tying up all the financial institutions into recognizing it as a financial intermediary. Ultimately, one of the things with uh, the mediated intangible again is that you engage with the software and the software acts as your proxy to perform a service for you. So there's co-presence and co-creation. Uh, there's certain levels of automation and also you can think about some of the things like a Shopify account or uh, any of the payment platforms or even Patreon as a service broker. Now let's talk about a couple of applications of theories and ideas. And these are crossing over between some of the elements you might recognize from aspects around international marketing. But one of the common things, uh, this was very big at the start of the, and the rise of the internet and e-commerce and sort of peaked around early uh, social media, was the idea that the internet is now 24-7 and the open all hours. Where this becomes, and what made this quite radical, is that society had off switches. Society had shutdown points. Radio stations would go off the airwaves. TV stations would stop broadcasting. Machines would get switched off. Literal automated services would not be running because they were closed. An automatic teller when I was going through university, the ATM at the university would power down after hours, about six o'clock, it would be shot. It wouldn't run. What's the, <laughs> a self-service device that switched off and had business hours. That was the mindset that we were running in as a society in the 90s. Roll on to the early 2000s and the internet as vending machine concept, the 24-7 coverage websites that didn't shut, that didn't switch off, gave this idea that the, you know, the internet was a place that never slept. But the end result is as a customer and as a producer, you still need to sleep. So this opens up some challenges. And one of those around the 24 seven internet as vending machine coverage is ensuring if you're using a forum that's dependent on real time, or a forum that has a very strong uh, time zone cluster 
that you have people available to monitor it in that time zone. It is also the expectation that you send an email and there's an expectation that response is quasi real time without really thinking, is that person who I'm asking to respond going to be awake? The second aspect, the internet, the international network of networks, gave rise to this international by accident, the idea of the born global. Now, an operation like PayPal is functionally a born global event because it doesn't need a physical co-location in order to provide its services. Whereas an operation like Amazon was still a conventional import-export business because it still needed to move physical objects from point to point. It still needs warehouse spaces. So it still uses all of those elements of international marketing, particularly around the idea of Amazon.com AU versus Amazon.co.uk versus Amazon.com. They are international shop fronts. They are international presence. So your international marketing theories and applications about franchising versus other methods all come into effect. What also became a bit of a challenge is there became this assumption that just because you were online, that automatically meant that you had to be global in your focus. Uh, a lot of people got very good at shouting very loudly that, oh, well, it's a global competition now. You know, if your little corner shop that's selling candy to the suburbs isn't online, then you're losing out to a big multinational. It's like rubbish. People still had to walk into your store to get your stuff. Your stuff's still going to need local distribution. So a factor to look at here is, are you international by intent? Are you international by design? Your international marketing, global marketing stuff kicks into gear because then you have to start thinking about where do you want your audience to be and what does that mean for you in terms of law, legislation, rules, socio-cultural aspects, your whole Hofsteads, uh, you know, you suddenly crack out your Hofstede, you got your Porter's Five Forces going as well, and you've got your basic market segmentation of Am I pulling an Ansoft matrix here? Have I offered anything to this market before? Does this market, is this a new market? Is this a new location? So be mindful of it. You may find yourself with international audiences that you don't have by intention. You don't necessarily need to then suddenly target them. If you make stuff for the local region, a couple of students last year made products that were just Canberra based and Canberra distributed. Yes, they were on Instagram. Yes, they were on a global platform, but their market was local and their target audience was local and that's all they needed to be, was local. So one of the things though, if you are doing digital, digital product, and we're talking intent, digital intangible, digital tangible, the capacity to replicate and ship without degradation, without data loss is very significant, very useful even if digital TV in Australia still has moments where you can't watch a live NRL match if too many people in the stadium are texting at once. Now, I just wanna quickly nip down to services marketing to steal a couple of theories and steal a couple of ideas. Big one, service blueprint. If you're not familiar with it, get familiar, give it a read, have a look at it. What it does and what's useful about it is it looks at the ways in which the customer engages with all the aspects of your service. And service blueprinting is really useful for website design, but also for online service delivery. If you start thinking about the customer's journey of engaging with you, you start thinking about what's the front stage aspect, what's uh, the backstage, what control do you have over Instagram, what control do you have over the content, the interactions of audience members in the forums. What are the elements that you can really adjust and what are the elements that you need to step back and go, this is outside my line of control, but it will influence my end user. Picking up a little thing that's gonna lean over into pricing. Distribution is a form of cost. It creates costs. 
it creates a price for the customer and the total financial price of a product includes the distribution cost and all of us have had moments where we wanted to buy something but the $20 t-shirt was not worth $120 worth of UPS Express post shipping similarly the time cost what price do you pay for speed and lastly this week's theory and application this is an interesting one for me is this is about information dissemination so this is about shifting a digital intangible the ideas of scientific journals and pushing them out through distribution channels of YouTube and Instagram I liked that my takeaway from this one was the six fundamentals because item six crisis management what to do when the people in your audience or the people who have received your information product disagree with you big at the moment around COVID-19 around climate change around any time as a health practitioner you go out and promote scientific health over value co-created health perceived health versus real health but functionally this paper's uh, useful key idea for me is I would use it in terms of both the advice that they have around your ethical and legal considerations and your crisis management plan but I also use it as a justification for a purpose of a social media platform or a justification of how I chose to engage negative customers or people who weren't my target audience but was still engaging with my product. And with that, as always, if you need me, I can be reached across the social media platforms, over the email, or through the model site. See you in the sequels.